All right, well, welcome back everybody. Um, we'll go ahead and get started for our last session of today. This afternoon's panel discussion will focus on creating a sustainable regional network and the importance of partnerships in achieving long-term sustainability goals. We are delighted to have faculty and administrators from the Pulte Institute for Global Development, the Notre Dame Environmental Change Initiative, the Center for Civic Innovation, and the Center for Sustainable Energy to share their expertise during this important discussion. Our moderator is Carol Mullaney, the Senior Director of the Office of Sustainability. In her leadership role, she, for, she focuses on partnerships with campus groups and individuals to advance the university's comprehensive sustainability strategy. Prior to coming to Notre Dame in 2010, Carol spent 10 years directing process improvement programs and leading strategic and executive level transformation pro projects for the Fortune 500 company, Pitney Bowes. Please join me in welcoming Carol Mullaney, who who will introduce our panelists. Carol? Thanks so much, Ginger. It's great to be with all of you on this beautiful uh, June afternoon. Um, as uh, Ginger mentioned, I think all of us, if we're involved in this work at any level, we realize that collaborative networks and partnerships are critical to all that we do. And I will have to say, working with our Office of Sustainability on campus, um, we are so fortunate to have the great partners that we do across campus, many of whom uh, you will meet in a few minutes. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce our four panelists who are gonna share with you um, expertise and experience in this area. Um, I will conduct the introductions at the start um, and then we'll turn it over one at a time to each of the four to share some insights uh, with you. Um, and then after all four have done that, we'll have time for some conversation and questions. If you do have questions during this time, feel free to put them in the chat, or uh, when we get to that point in time, you can simply raise your hand and um, you know, we can have that conversation at that time. Um, so I would like to uh, introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, first will be Tom Puricall. Um, who is the program director within the Pulte Institute for Global Development's Innovation and Practice Division. His extensive programming and project design experience encompass sectors such as peace building and governance, education, disaster, risk reduction, and water sanitation and hygiene. He is also a term assisting teaching professor within the Keough School of Global Affairs and directs a large USAID funded global education research initiative called Supporting Holistic and Actionable Research in Education. You're gonna see a theme here with all these introductions and in that each of these talented individuals has multiple roles. So I'll move on to our second introduction and that is Danielle Wood. Danielle is the Associate Director for Research in the Center for Civic Innovation at the University of Notre Dame and also the project director of the Notre Dame Global Adaptation Initiative, affectionately known as ND Gain, which is a key program of the Notre Dame Environmental Change Initiative. ND Gain works to enhance the world's understanding of adaptation through knowledge, products, and services that inform public and private actions and investments in vulnerable communities. Our third, panelist will be Jay Brackman. And Jay is the director of the Center for Civic Innovation and professor of the practice in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. He has broad experience in innovation in both academia and industry. He is the author of an introductory engineering textbook and has won several awards for teaching. He is also a co-founder of Emu Technology, a company with a patented patented architecture for big data analytics with offices in South Bend and New York. In 2018, he received the Grenville Clark Award from Notre Dame given to a faculty member whose voluntary activities advance the cause of peace and human rights. And then our fourth um, speaker is someone you all know well because uh, you have met her throughout this afternoon if you didn't know her before and that is Ginger Sigmund. 
Ginger joined the Center for Sustainable Energy at Notre Dame, which is known as ND Energy, in July 2014 as the managing director. But she had been a part of the Notre Dame community prior to that since 2009, previously serving as managing director of the Materials Science of Actinides in the Energy Frontier Research Center. Under the direction of Peter Burns at the University of Notre Dame, Ginger received a PhD in actinide materials in 2010. She received her bachelor's degrees in chemistry and geology from North Carolina State University. So welcome to all of our panelists. Um, I am going to start and turn uh, the microphone over to Tom Puricall, who's gonna share with it, us some of his insights and work. Tom? Great, thanks, Carol. Can you guys hear me okay? Great, good. Uh, pleasure to be with all of you today and thanks for allowing me to, to join you and to speak today. As, as Carol mentioned, I work with the Pulte Institute for Global Development. The Pulte Institute works across this intersection of research, policy, and practice and uh, tries to translate research uh, to be um, have a have a greater effect and impact in decision making and um, particularly on the on the policy and the practice side. So uh, that's a lot of what I do. And uh, as especially as we kind of think about this goal of carbon neutrality and and some of the the real obstacles that stand in our way, but opportunities as well. Uh, two two concepts I'd like to really put forward to focus on our our really think at the systems level and to consider uh, the social implications of, of much of the work that we would be doing and we do, and that needs to be done across the space. So uh, I, now I don't know if you guys can see my slides, Barb, can you present them? Oh, great, excellent, thank you very much. Um, you can go to the next slide. Great, thanks. So, I say the, the best image and analogy that I can think about when we think when we consider the environment and um, this this broad network of complex systems is is the human body, uh, and and considering that like the human body, societies are more than just the sum of any individual organ or system, right? So and it's 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 really interesting when you think about um, the way that our nervous system works and in conjunction with our digestive system and how many of these functions we don't need to think about. But when something happens, then the whole system can go awry. Uh, and, I, and I bring this up because if, if we're really going to make sustainable and high impact changes with regards to environment and in this front of sustainability, we need to be looking at the very DNA of the system and, and look to affect it at that level. Uh, and this calls for us to, to consider the, the larger system at, at, as a large and at, at, as a whole and, and consider the effects that we're having um, uh, across the board. Achieving sustainable um, development outcomes depends on the contributions of any number of multiple interconnected actors. Um, we this this comes from a lot of research done by the U.S. Agency for International Development, and um, affecting any one actor is is really not enough when we think about the relationships and the roles and the the rules that that govern any existing system. So um, we really do need to be thinking about the, these relationships and, and in the incentives as well that kind of guide, guide this larger system as a whole, right? Um, this requires thoughtful engagement with many segments, considering the, the large ecosystem of actors that are involved and, uh, and ensuring that technical innovations and social reforms produce positive and lasting changes by being inclusive and, uh, and considering the broad range of, of actors that are involved. So. Um, and that economic development alone, which is which is important in order to make sure that systems can be sustainable ultimately, or changes in systems can be sustainable, that in and of itself is not uh, a sole indicator to consider, particularly if those economic reforms and changes that happen um, are not taking place ubiquitously and including people across different social circles. Next slide. 
so when we think about these systems, um, I, 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 what I'd like to demonstrate by this slide is the, the broad interconnectedness um, of these various um, systems. And it looks like uh, one of my images didn't capture towards the end. Oh, there it is. Great, thank you, teacher. Um, and so, we, as we as we consider the the interrelatedness around these systems, um, one of the or a number of factors to consider is that this um, this culture of innovation that has brought the U.S. and and other countries to where they are right now in terms of their own economic development and the progress they've they've been able to generate um, comes at the investment of. Um, and, and across a broad number of areas when you consider education uh, that needed to be available. Um, the regulatory frameworks, when you look at land rights and property rights, um, looking at availability of resources and protections around insurance and, and financial structures um, or commercial law, uh, and how that ultimately gave rise to a number of innovations that provided for transportation and then ultimately the creation of markets uh, and and this interplay between rural areas and urban areas and the very distinct properties and that and contributions to society that each one of those uh, contexts brings um, for those with a trained eye they'll notice that the images in the lower right hand corner uh, are actually of Sichuan China which has evolved incredibly over just the past 30 years that first picture is what it looked like in the 1980s and when you look at the the current picture of where it is right now you can see that a lot of these systems and, and changes are dynamic right so we need to be able to evolve and change as as we consider the amount of um, that of, of what exists now, but what could be in the future, and being able to adapt to these changes and uh, and and make sure that um, that there's broader inclusion across the board, um, and and so a lot of this really considers the the fact that um, the again this interrelationship and this interplay between the different actors and to the these kind of these systems that are operating within the larger complex system, right? So, next slide. Great. Now, the reality is, unfortunately, that the world is experiencing a widening gap in inequalities, particularly on the income level, right? So approximately 1% of wealth owners in a country is usually, um, usually commands about 25 to 40% of the wealth in, in that country. Um, when you look at the United States alone, uh, we account for 15% of uh, global emissions in the world, although we only make up about 5% of the world's population. There are a number of, um, of inequalities and inequities that, that we need to be considering as, as policies are made and as we think about how to roll out potential innovations and, um, and approaches. Uh, Latin America, unfortunately, our neighbors to the south are one of the more in unequal regions in the world, uh, where approximately 10% uh, of the, the kind of the richest 10% of amassed about 71% of the region's wealth, and that includes land in particular. Uh, and those numbers are as 2014. These growing divides only speak more to the fact that many of the changes that we're trying to make, uh, and particularly uh, around environmental reform and, and, um, and kind of thinking about the systems involved to that, are, are only leading to greater inequalities and um, how that's a, that's a really strong and important indicator of, of the kind of the work that we need to see take, take form. Um, and the, the other reality is that regions that are most susceptible and vulnerable to climate changes right now are those with the lowest carbon footprint. Um, so when we look at the, the poor in particular, um, that they may not be consuming as much um, certainly not emitting as much, but they're usually on the more vulnerable uh, land areas, whether they be kind of downstream uh, or downhill areas that are more prone to flooding. Many times they've got to be along coastal areas or rivers based on livelihood needs that, that can also contribute to uh, or, or experience high degrees of flooding. Um, with little insurance and safety nets to support them the way that uh, that would help them uh, recover and become more resilient and adaptable 
uh, should they or once they experience these these either natural or man-made shocks that usually happen particularly in um, countries that are still uh, in, in a, a a higher level of development. Uh, so that's something that uh, we kind of think about this adaptive capacity and, and the need for uh, building resilience and, and in reducing vulnerability of some of these societies uh, as we consider changes to the environment and, um, and in terms of like this goal as well of uh, carbon neutrality. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. I love that image of the, the human body and the, the interconnectedness and integration. Um, and, I, and I will just say to your comments, you know, when we think about um, equity and justice issues are very timely for us as we at Notre Dame um, approach next academic year, where we're going to be exploring through the Notre Dame Forum issues of a just transition to a sustainable future. So Thank you. I uh, will turn it over now to our second panelist, and that is Danielle Wood. Can everybody see that? Um, they can see the uh, just a slide for with the environmental change initiative header. I'm not sure. So uh, we see your notes. Displays. Hmm. So on the top, the display settings. There. So while it's uh -huh. in presenter mode. Do you see it? Yes. All okay. good now. Super. Um, so, um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, as Carol mentioned, I'm Danielle Wood, and I wear two hats at Notre Dame. Uh, mainly, I'm the Associate Director for Civic Innovations uh, for research at the Center for Civic Innovation, but I also serve as the Program Director for the ND gain at the Environmental Change Initiative. And um, I'm here with my ECI hat on and we'll focus on some of the specific activities at the Environmental Change Initiative that I'm connected to. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about some of the research areas, I, I encourage you to go to the ECI website. But um, starting kind of just with a broad overview of ECI, the, East, the Environmental Change Initiative uh, focuses on contributing to solutions to complex environmental challenges with a focus on minimizing the trade-offs between human welfare and environmental well-being. And what that tangibly looks like might be a, uh, a researcher uh, of water quality working directly with a farmer on best management practices to reduce uh, runoff on their fields and understanding what some of the barriers to the, the farmer working on that would be rather than working on policy that would just mandate different practices by the farmer. So um, ECI captures this idea with the phrase science serving society. And in doing this ECI builds interdisciplinary and multi-sector collaborations to develop and translate environmental and climate related research that benefits society. So uh, the focus areas for this are diverse, but they include everything from climate change and ecological forecasting, agriculture and freshwater ecology, um, hydrology and water resources. But in short, many of the areas that are in the, the domain of ecosystem services. And so with over 50 affiliated faculty, ECI's work is geographically expansive. It moves from the international to local efforts which is why I'm kind of the, the in-between person for, for, for these, for these uh, our panelists today. So um, I'm gonna focus on the information I'm, uh, I, I'm providing in the space of climate adaptation, because I think uh, there's opportunities here for thinking about mitigation and adaptation together, or as Professor Haverkamp mentioned, um, that idea of co-benefits so we can build regional resilience and education and research opportunities while contributing to carbon neutrality through carbon offsets and better planning. And that's kind of because um, the tools that I work with focus on adaptation, that's where I'm gonna kind of focus my conversation just now, but this is, this is clearly a much broader conversation. So in addition to its other work, the Environmental Change Initiative, as mentioned, holds decision support tools for climate adaptation. And they include this Global Adaptation Index, or as Carol mentioned, any gain, and the Urban Adaptation Assessment that just covers US cities, the UAA. 
And as a quick overview for ND, ND Gain, um, it's been around for quite a while. It was one of the first and is still one of the few international climate and adaptation indices. Um, GAIN shows which countries, as measured by this index anyway, are best prepared to deal with challenges brought on by climate and other disruptions. It was designed to help governments, businesses, and nonprofits, so not just a single sector, better prioritize national level investments for informed responses to these challenges. It covers all of the UN, all of the UN countries for which we can get data. So that's roughly 182 of 192 countries. Um, and this graphic that you're seeing there is, is how the, uh, the actual index, which can be broken down into different levels is kind of plays out when you see it in a heat map on the, for, for the countries. And um, this next tool, the urban adaptation assessment, and, and here in this visualization showing South Bend, was completed in 2019 and covers over 270 cities in the US and Puerto Rico for those cities that are over 100,000 in population. The, um, the UAA was funded uh, originally funded through the Kresge Foundation. And they did this because they recognized that at this point in our development, the United States has over three quarters of its population in urban areas and they're already experiencing climate impacts. So for example, um, to kind of bring it locally home here for those that are, are at Notre Dame, South Bend's experienced a 500 and a thousand year flood in just the last five or six years alone. So both of these decision tools have seen a lot of traffic. Um, here's some stats here for you know, the, the website. Um, they, you know, they, they've, they, they actually get some of the highest levels of views and downloads for any of Notre Dame's websites. And I'm highlighting that because um, I find it significant because it's clear that climate issues, whether we're talking about mitigation or adaptation is in the public imagination right now. So there's, I think there's a policy window. There's a window of opportunity here to step into in a way there just hasn't been before, even though these opportunities have always kind of been waiting for us. So um, just to kind of give a sense of who uses this, kinds of this kind of information, for GAIN, the data is used by a variety of stakeholders, including federal agencies around the world or NGOs like the Global Center on Adaptation that's out of the Netherlands, um, but also including financial groups like Morgan Stanley. Users of the UAA similarly are nonprofits and governmental en entities, but the government users are generally local municipalities and states. And these tools have been highlighted in a number of journal articles and feeds like The Economist or City Lab. So again, bringing this back to my point, these tools could be important for making progress on climate adaptation, but I think as ECI thinks about the next generation of these tools, the 2.0 of this work, um, what if we were to redesign them to include consideration for climate impacts? Or whether that's done or not, there's a number of things that could be done in this space that would increase regional resilience. And to help seed some of these ideas for the next steps, I'm just gonna give a quick overview for those who aren't familiar with it of the constructions of these kind of decision support tools. So both of the uh, assessment tools measure two primary constructs, vulnerability or it's called risk in the UAA and readiness. And both are broken down into these sub constructs for vulnerability or risk, it's exposure, sensitivity, ad adaptive capacity, and for readiness, it's broken down into economic uh, issues, governance, and social components. And the graphic uh, at the right shows how ND gain is broken down. It's got a, uh, considerably more indicators than UAA. Um, but those domains, as you see, um, and UAA does follow a similar model with like a more actionable level census tract data for cities. But to reconnect to Tom's theme, the approach seeks to measure kind of this broader system. It includes, for both tools, we saw that many of our measures capture social vulnerability um, are also in these geographies that have high environmental impacts. For the UAA, many of our climate vulnerability metrics were the same ones that were used to capture disproportionality in the impacts for um, the pandemic we just experienced, a lot of those same metrics. So as a Catholic university looking for those co-benefits that were mentioned in carbon neutrality, this provides opportunities to live out the values of Catholic social teaching and focus on climate justice, 
provide greater regional resilience and opportunities for research, teaching, and learning. So I'm, I'm, you know, you can see I'm really kind of interested in these co-benefits as we think of this. So the possibility for building on existing if efforts in our region are many. Uh, we have strong partnerships here that I'm sure Jay will talk more about. Uh, but like ND Energy, ECI, and CCI have long-standing governmental and non-governmental community-based partnerships and ECI being more rural, CCI being more urban. But for ECI, some of these existing relationships that could be tapped in the space of natural resources management and uh, protection include the Indiana State Department's Agriculture, Soil and Water Conservation Districts, uh, the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service who hold easements on agricultural lands, uh, the Nature Conservancy, the Friends of the St. Joe River. ECI also has strong uh, partnerships with multiple rural uh, K through 12 systems. So uh, I'll end with just saying again, there's a strong foundation regionally for opportunities for mitigation and adaptation together. And ECI would be really excited to partner and explore this space a little bit. That's wonderful. Thank you, Danielle. And such great work. I mean, this the, the tools, uh, ND Gain and UAA are just so valuable, as you pointed out, to so many entities. Um, so now we'll move over to your other uh, home. Uh, and to Jay, so representing the uh, Center for Civic Innovation. So I'm going to turn it over to Jay Brockman. And uh, let's see, let me just slide this over where I can push the right button. And uh, can everybody see that okay? Slides up there? Good. All right. So, um, yeah, I'd like to say a little bit about the, the Center for Civic Innovation and, and really, uh, you know, appreciate the opportunity to talk here. As I was Getting ready for this, um, I was trying to think what's the best way to uh, present the work. And um, when we talk about atmospheric carbon, there's a lot of predictable models that, you know, unfortunately lead towards downward spirals, you know, in case, um, unless something is done. Um, what I wanted to talk about is what can happen, you know, when communities get together, sometimes in unexpected ways that can uh, start spinning things in the other direction. And um, I wanted to, to show that through an example. So um, a little bit about the uh, Center for Civic Innovation. Um, we're a center within the um, College of Engineering. And uh, our mission is to address community identified civic priorities really in a two county area, uh, St. Joe and Elkhart counties, um, and integrate principles of design that come from the social sciences and engineering um, linked with interdisciplinary research and education projects. And as far as education goes, really the main way we get our work done is through an internship program where we have approximately 50 college and high school students from across the region that, that work with uh, us during the year and um, increasingly working on academic year projects with one such as the energy minor um, that we can in involve students in our projects and our vision really is an inclusive culture of innovation that fully engages you know university community partnerships um, for the common good across this two county area. Um, one of the very first projects that we took on uh, was an area on the southeast side of town called Bowman Creek. And uh, just for context, uh, Notre Dame is up here. Our office is about a mile west of downtown South Bend and the southeast side is uh, another half mile or mile or so um, south of downtown. And um, Bowman Creek itself was identified as one of the most impaired tributaries of the St. Joe River. Um, and it was something that the Department of Public Works had been concerned about. Um, through our internship program, uh, we started going door to door, you know, to, to residents and um, asking, you know, what their vision might be for the creek, what might we do? And the most common response it got was, what creek? Um, ask me about something I care about, like safety or so on. Um, people that lived immediately adjacent to the creek knew it as something that with increasing climate change, and as Danielle mentioned, thousand year floods and 500 year floods in a five year period as something that literally had destroyed homes, you know, had, had undermined foundations. Um, people that didn't live adjacent to the creek didn't necessarily know it was a creek because of some bad engineering decisions. It would not only flood, but it would also run dry. It had been um, rerouted and it was often viewed as just a, a, a scary place, not a place where you would allow children. Um, so with that, you know, background, um, we had our internship program ready to start at a park where the creek goes through, um, which is uh, Ravina Park. We were ready for a picnic with uh, some community groups. The mayor was set to join us. And then the weekend before, 
um, there were, you know, over 20 rounds of gunfire, which fortunately, you know, had not um, hit any children. The children were playing in the park at the time. So our, our kickoff picnic turned, merged with a take back our park rally with neighbors that lived adjacent to the park. And uh, our mayor, Pete Buttigieg, who's now, you know, Secretary of Transportation, was asking for, for commentary. And one of the first things that came through was a seven-year-old girl um, mentioned that this slide right here had a, a landing area that was a chunk of concrete and something needed to be done about it. And um, that was what was first and foremost on, on her mind. Um, people heard that and kids that were playing basketball said, and yeah, there's no water fountain here, which is true. Um, so our interns and others realized, you know, here's an opportunity uh, to do something. This is a neighborhood that's heard a lot of promises um, and not necessarily a lot of delivery. So a couple of interns got together and did a little bit of quick research on, on playground materials and shredded tires and whatnot and got that fixed within 48 hours. Um, the Parks Department and Public Works, which is kind of no mean feat to get two departments of the city together, saw, well, if a seven-year-old girl can kick something off and some college and high school students can respond in 48 hours, I think we can take care of this drinking fountain problem. And they did. Um, so we had this virtuous cycle that really spun up with a child suggestion at a Take Back the Park rally. And what that led to um, eventually was some serious remediation, you know, with Ravina Park um, that, that turned this creek, you know, into a, a an amenity um, with some bank restoration, which was funded by the Pekagan Band of the Potawatomi, Potawatomi Indians um, who were looking to do some uh, environmental um, remediation. Um, moving beyond that, this is a city that during Mayor Pete's thousand homes and thousand days left 25% of the lots um, vacant, um, found you know, an opportunity for some creative adaptive reuse that addresses um, the um, undersized um, urban tree canopy that we have in our region that has you know tremendous impacts um, not only you know in terms of climate and and energy and and you know heat zones um, but is also you know an amenity to a neighborhood um, there's a piling on of goodwill of neighborhood associations of city government of students of researchers and so on um, which starts to give a neighborhood a sense of promise. And everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon when that starts happening. So fast forward um, a couple of years when United Way was looking, you know, to create a new, um, you know, early childhood center, um, you know, one of the troubled intersections in the Southeast neighborhood, you know, was chosen as a location and it will soon um, break ground. So I guess what I want to leave with is that, you know, we're dealing with a set of issues that can feel overwhelming and kind of hopeless and models that predict doom. Um, but sometimes, you know, if you look in unexpected places, and I would argue you can bank on it, you know, if you energize people the right way, you can spin up a virtuous cycle um, that, you know, has the capability to tackle some really challenging problems. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jay. I love that. A virtuous cycle and that it started with a seven-year-old. Um, that's, that's a great, hopeful story for all of us. Um, now we'll move on to our fourth panelist, uh, who's been doing a little bit of everything today, uh, leading us all, and that is Ginger Sigmund. Ginger? All right. Thank you very much, Carol. So, uh, today, I just want to want to bring this all together and really talk about paths forward that um, that kind of sum everything up. As Michael said earlier, uh, one of our previous speakers, that energy transitions through everything. So, um, you know, we have to take responsibility and be more sustainable through all our actions. This starts with what, how we spend our money and how we use our vote. We have to say that we want access to renewable and sustainable energy and invest in the clean energy economy. This can be done by investing in renewable energy certificates that help power companies build their portfolios. And you can do this by voting in government officials that will speak up for sustainable energy. We also have to hold companies accountable to create markets that meet zero emission plans. And then they in turn can hold their supply chains accountable for those standards as well. 
Uh, this also incorporates the responsibility of lifestyle shifts. I'm not saying you have to drop everything and never leave your house again, but pay attention to your consumption, your energy conservation, and food waste. So an example of that is uh, Notre Dame's uh, Grind to Energy program through the Office of Sustainability that's now on campus for food scraps, and also the Food Rescue program where they're supporting a, non, a local nonprofit, Cultivate. So there are many ways we can do this, and personally, you can take this by just starting a compost pile at your home. Um, the next step would be collaborations are critical for uh, getting these things done so at the state and local level. So we need to align our stakeholders to make these sustainable actions happen. These stakeholders can be government leaders, policymakers, community leaders, NGOs and nonprofit groups, and even our neighbors. So we are collaborating with lots of groups across campus here at ND Energy. We work with CCI, CCI to connect to South Bend and other community groups. We're working with a nonprofit community center in Puerto Rico to support and promote solar energy. And then we're working with the Indiana Michigan Power Solar Farm to give our students access to that uh, data. So this is building our network of people working toward this sustainable goal. Next is embracing the technologies to make cleaner options cheap for all. This includes the low and middle income countries. So these technologies should lift up the quality of life around the world by getting to net zero and even negative carbon technologies. Sequestration and carbon capture will be key for this. So we're embracing working with our researchers across campus to promote their research in the areas like CSTAR, where they're making synthetic fuels by up converting light hydrocarbons from shale gas. So we have to keep in mind the comprehensive picture of what must happen to achieve carbon neutrality. Solar and wind power and battery technology are essential to supplying sustainable energy. And so the technologies are out there. We just need to deploy them and keep going. Communication is key. We need to talk to all who will listen and uh, keep the message of achieving carbon neutrality focused, unified, and simple. Uh, this, this includes translating scientific research into e easy to understand language and applications where we work with the faculty and the students to translate their research to outreach programs that can be accessible to all ages. So we spread the word through a research symposia like this, uh, our seminar speakers, energy week, and outreach activities to the local schools and community events. Um, so small actions can uh, add up when people, when more people are doing them. And so that can then influence policy changes. So uh, you know, large systematic changes are needed to achieve carbon mass or mass decarbonization, but we have to start somewhere and it starts with all of us. So it starts with me, it starts with you. Every action that reduces our carbon footprint is a step in the right directions. Uh, so at the university, students will pay, will have a huge part in this. Um, what universities do best is to teach students through classes and research, and then they go out and teach others. The, the energy studies minor students are a testament that we are sending students out into the world that are more prepared to have these kinds of tough conversations. So with enough voices on the same path, we can call for policy changes and move sustainability initiatives forward. So I will end with uh, a list of recommended books to help you on your journey of achieving carbon neutrality and a better understanding of sustainable actions that you can do and that you can help others do so that we will have a network of, of stakeholders invested in creating a better world. So uh, just to, to kind of, you know, we've all kind of focused on that think globally and act locally. Wonderful. Thank you, Ginger. Um, thank you for, for first of all, putting on such a wonderful symposium and guiding us today, but for such um, great positive comments and for giving us all our summer reading list, right? So um, as we're launching on the summer, I'm going on vacation next week. And I was thinking, what kind of, what reading will I take? Now I know what it is. So thank you. Um, I have some questions. I'm gonna invite anyone here in the audience um, if you do have some questions, you, either, you can either put them in the chat or raise your hand um, at any point and, and uh, we'll get to your question. But um, I will start and what I'll do is I'll pose a question 
um, um, maybe ask one of you to start, and this would apply to all four panelists if you'd like if you'd like to comment on it. But we've talked about networks and collaboration, and we we've talked global level, right? A lot of what Tom is doing, right, uh, and Danielle is working at all really levels. We've we've talked global to the regional. If you think about climate justice issues, what are some common themes that you might see? at the global level, as well as at the regional and local level. Um, and Danielle, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, I, I'll, uh, I'll kick it off, but I, I'm not, it might not be as intelligible as I might wanna make it because I'd like to link to some of the things that Tom talked about and I didn't know what he would talk about. Um, so I can't, <laughs> when we first started, um, but I was thinking about in particular, you know, education is one that comes across these. When we talk about social issues, um, there's a lot of things that are coupled in the social sphere that um, are common, whether we're talking about uh, international kind of down to our local or regional. And one thing that he mentioned was the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality and in how our economic benefits are distributed in any particular place. Um, and interestingly, um, if you run the OECD PISA assessment, which is the program um, of international student assessment, it's basically a measure of high school students across the whole, all of the, all of the different OECD countries, um, the Gini coefficient of high inequality is correlated with low educational outcomes. And the United States is actually, um, I think between it and Chile are the two highest uh, unequal countries with the lowest PISA scores as far as the developed countries go. And so I think um, these common themes are that we see uh, impacts that we see those impacts of, of climate in spaces where access, the things that we know that help with mobility and help with better ways of life are correlated in spaces of just, um, you know, lack of access to all types of social goods, whether we're talking about education or fair house, you know, stable housing or all sorts of things. So that, and that that's true here in the United, or here just in South Bend, I won't even say the United States, because if we look at um, uh, housing mobility here in the United States, any one of our low income neighborhoods that tend to have lower tree canopy, uh, higher heat impacts, which can be as much as 10 degrees in an urban area, they also are ones that have super high housing housing instability. Um, so that that's I'm kind of drifting across things, but it is those are those social environmental correlates are across all scales. Thank you, Danielle. I'd invite. Would any of the other panelists like to um, sure comment? Yeah, I'd like to add. Um, so other aspects of climate justice that are going to be. Uh, global are, uh, is kind of really looking at this just transition of jobs. So as we move away from coal and, and you know, fossil fuel uh, energy sources, those people can't just be put out. So we need to think about how they're going to continue their livelihoods and, and move into the, the green economy and move into renewable energy sources for themselves. Um, and that's going to be everywhere. So as as people start looking for jobs in this area, we need to make sure that they're there. That's a great point. Thank you, Ginger. Tom. Yeah, it, th this can go in so many different directions, right? When we talk about climate justice, uh, but I I, I, I think one of the big things that I um, have, have really kind of appreciated is the fact that. You, you have a number of people within countries now, within the developing countries or low middle income countries, I should say, that, that, that are trying to um, increase their standard of living, uh, maybe buy a larger house. When I think about uh, my, my own father as a story, like uh, he grew up in a house that was 15 by 15 feet. And he was in that house, this was in like Pune, India, back in the 1940s and 50s. And um, the, the, he shared that house with four siblings and his parents, right? Like they, 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 then there was a kitchen, a dining, well, kitchen, basic living room area, and then kind of a bedroom ultimately, right? So now when you look at that future generation, um, almost all the siblings now are in houses that are 
2,500 square feet or 4,000 square hundred feet, right? And so, um, and, and so you, you, you think about, and, and, and the house that, that he lived in w wasn't secure in terms of to, to theft, certainly wasn't protected from the elements. If there was any flooding, they were very vulnerable, weren't even kind of any decent bathrooms. And so it was um, a real, uh, just a uh, Kind of, a, kind of a thinking about how do we help people lead and get to a, a place where they can lead dignified lives, and and make those accommodations. But then also thinking about the effect of the on the environment when you think about everybody raising their standard of living um, to to a kind of a this uh, as to a to a livable level, and and the impact on on the population on, on the world when you consider that the world's population is increasing by about 75 to 80 million people per year um, and so it really does call on those who have a lot to consider um, the impacts that we're having on the environment and uh, the, the the justice issues that come at play when we're helping people to live in like or allowing and, and afford making accommodations for people to live in um, in to achieve a, a certain standard of living, um, what does that mean for the rest of us, and um, and how does how does that affect the 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 environment at large, right? So, thank you. Um, so I know we've talked a bit about the um, social factors, and Tom, I know you mentioned them. You know, of social factors that are part of this this system, if we think about that. Um, and what are some of the other social factors that you all see that um, might impact either, either as a barrier or as an aid you know, to our goals of carbon neutrality? And Tom, anything you'd like to comment and then, then any of the others? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll actually pick up on one of the references that Danielle just made around education. I, I think one of the biggest ones that we're realizing is the impact that girls' education can have on the environment. Uh, number one, they're, you're uh, increasing access to a, a much richer population in terms of access to the, to the labor force. Um, you're also allowing women to have greater control of reproductive health issues and um, and what happens kind of in decision making in terms of when they get married and and possibly getting them out of a cycle of early marriages and um, having and, and this can have tremendous effects on the environment, especially when we think about the effects on on broad population numbers, for example, right? So um, and and all in ways that can be culturally and contextually appropriate, but are also, but that recognizes the dignity of women within, within these countries and contexts. So um, I'd say that's one of the biggest examples that I've been able to identify of, of a kind of a social indicator that can have a high impact on, um, on the environment. But other things as well, looking at um, access to health care of populations and um, do our people uh, afforded a, kind of a, an equitable access to some of these basic services that will allow human flourishing at large but and making sure that it's done in a in a way that's that's broadly inclusive because ultimately that's that's kind of one of the big things right when we talk about sustainable development and sustainability overall it's just um we want everybody to be experiencing some level of standard of living quality of life uh and so it, it doesn't really help if it's just happening and have a kind of a higher tier of uh, society when i hear about social factors i think you know i tend to I'm thinking towards moving that at the very personal level, as opposed to, you know, some of the, the higher level issues, um, you know, cross-cutting society. And it comes back to like, when we um, polled people in the neighborhood about Bow Bowman Creek and hearing, ask me about something that I care about. I think, you know, really understanding at an individual, at a family, at a household level, what do people care about? And carbon neutrality may not, that likely wouldn't be one of the things um, that you'll hear, but what do people care about and, and how does it connect? Um, so, um, you know, for example, um, when we look at, you know, some of the houses in, in some of these neighborhoods in South Bend that are older houses that have lead paint issues, um, but that also have, um, you know, leaky faucets and, and poor insulation, you know, um, people care about their utility bills. And, um, you know, so if there are initiatives um, that help people 
make it through the month that you know add up cumulatively to a net good for society. So I think, again, I, I want to kind of take this, the social factors, and there are certainly them at all different you know levels of society. But understanding it at the individual and the household level, I think, is is really important. And what matters to them. I think just to add a little bit to that is, um, you know, when we think about just international to local and the social issues in that space, we're going to be seeing more and more, I mean, land is affected, you know, land that is habitable, land that is buildable. And we already have uh, globally housing affordability challenges and so, you know, we're going to see climate refu refugees at the global and even the national level. We're going to see climate gentrification at the national level down to the, the city level. Um, and, you know, that housing affordability challenge is just going to keep increasing. And so I think that's one, you know, housing is a basic need. Stable housing affects health, education, a whole host of other things. So I think that's one that we really, the more we can couple that piece, knowing that, you know, as you build green infrastructure and you build, you know, restore wetlands for flooding buffers, et cetera, et cetera, you're going to be taking land that was in certain kinds of production out and it's going to be going somewhere. You know, I mean, things are going to, we're going to have to change the way we think about development. Great. We do have a question from our audience, um, and this this kind of ties to the the kind of local or or country to international level. Um, so uh, someone mentioned that a student here at Notre Dame, an international energy studies minor student, mentioned that many of the professors and students with whom she interacted in classes um, related to energy and climate viewed issues only from an American point of view. The history of each country, the geography, et cetera, call for a variety of solutions. So this is kind of internally focused. How can we at Notre Dame do a better job of broadening our view of climate challenges and solutions and correspondingly um, teach our students or provide them opportunities for a broadened experience? So I'll open that up to anyone for any comments there. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just say that that's, that's a, a wonderful question and that's exactly what we need to be doing um, by having our collaborations and, and, and people that we know in other countries that can talk to at that level and, and help us better understand how things are happening in other countries and you know way, the way it affects the, the people there. Um, uh, just you know, one collaboration that Tom's group and the Indian Indy Energy Group uh, have explored is looking at the energy landscapes in other countries. Um, you know, we, we've actually explored uh, doing some of this in Nepal. And so we've gone on an initial trip to really under, try to start understanding what the issues are so that we can build upon that and, and bring that back to campus to teach others. Um, and then another example is uh, one of the capstone classes that Indy Energy just created is uh, looking at Puerto Rico. And so it's actually using Puerto Rico as a learning process, not we're going down there to help them do this and teach them how to do it. We're learning from them because they are coming in on the ground and saying we want solar energy and they're making it happen. And so we're actually taking students down there we introduce them from the top down by having them meet with officials in the capital, and then we go from bottom up by having them meet with community leaders that are doing this on the ground. And so, you know, taking them and putting people, you know, introducing these people to uh, our students to these new ideas is a way to, to broaden that and bring that back. Yeah, I want to flip that question around a little bit that, you know, every year we've had um, interns, you know, from a variety of different countries, in particular from a number of African nations. And uh, there's one intern in particular I'm thinking of from Rwanda, who specifically came to Notre Dame, you know, looking to study energy related issues and, and technologies that he could, you know, bring back home. And after working with us for a summer, he was surprised to discover that, you know, there were neighborhoods in South Bend um, that were dealing, you know, with, with similar challenges. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's, um, you know, 
I think it's important to, to, to look at both and um, that and to, to, to you know, clarify that these are global issues and, and they, they play out across the planet, including in our own backyards. And to underscore what Jay just said, um, you know, having having <laughs> being a fellow at the CSC, I will say that that um, the the interesting thing about that comment is is that we found that some students have more in common with students of a similar socioeconomic background across the world or across the nation than they do with lower income and understanding some of the challenges, whether it's around energy or something else in their own city. And, and so those parallels of lower income while, you know, a, a, a informal settlement in, in Haiti is not going to look like a low income neighborhood in South Bend, um, it might look something like our tent cities. You know, I mean, there's a whole host of kind of parallels that we can draw from where, yes, there are cultural norms as well that we need to take into account as we move uh, from different areas, but they're also, um, you know, some of these major drivers are related to income inequality and income as kind of Tom kind of framed from the, from the beginning. Wonderful. Okay, I'm gonna ask you, Tom, did you have something? to address to that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Ginger and everybody else covered it. That was great. Very good. Thanks. Okay. This is your final question. It's, it's a, a softball here. Um, so we're talking about all these issues of carbon neutrality and, and often they're doomsday scenarios, right? And we're looking at, at the, the figures, um, you know, what year, 2025, 2040, when do we need to act by? They're all pretty close dates, right? As we think about the short-term horizon. Um, I'd, I'd like for each of you to, to uh, think about what's one bright spot that you see um, in the future? Are you optimistic? And what's a bright spot that you see that, that, that we can work on? I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I have, I have two kids that are like, you know, 28 and 25 ish, I forget exactly. There's somewhere in that range. The, um, but um, the, uh, you know, I mean, I, I worry for their future, of course, you know, as a parent. And you hear these, and, you know, I won't be there to see how everything plays out in their old age. Um, but I am very encouraged by them specifically and their friends and their, their generation um, that. Um, I think you know they've got a lot on their plates and a lot think a lot of things to face, but I'm not seeing a lot of doom and gloom in the way that they interact, and that gives me hope. Good, thank you, Jay. We won't tell them that you didn't know their exact ages. That's okay. <laughs> I can forget their ages. I just can't forget their birthdays. So. Yeah. So I'll just say that I'm optimistic because I feel like the technologies are out there to get us to carbon neutral and even carbon negative one day to, you know, even it, it can be, I think it can be done, um, especially if we go across multi-level and multi-sector, uh, we can we can reach those goals. And, um, you know, just giving people, you know, our students the tools to think about these issues and how to go about answering them so that they can develop the technologies of the future to make it happen. Thanks, Ginger. Tom? Yeah, I'll say, I think one of the things that makes me hopeful is the, the, the process of doing this can actually be very unitive and restorative in, in some ways when you think about, um, I, I think about like international um, kind of water treaties and um, that you, the, the water is, is, a, is a big issue, right? I mean, it's just in terms of the, the low levels of it and um, the amount that we use of it, both for food, secure, food, food security, I mean, agriculture overall, um, industry, healthcare and just basic consumption um, in addition to uh, you know, a number of other uses. So uh, but, but, like, we've seen a lot of cooperation happen between countries because they realize they look, we, we need to make this work. It's an existential issue, right? So, um, so rather than fight over it, let's find solutions and, uh, and ways that this can actually 
help our and accommodate our societies. And, and we've seen examples, really, really strong models of how that level of cooperation has helped strengthen uh, ties between countries. Now, now I'd say you can go further. It doesn't necessarily resolve all the issues and it, you, you, you can be, it's something that we can, can take it as an example of how um, cooperation can, can help communities and societies work better, but, uh, but, it, can, but it is something that's, it's an entry point um, and can kind of really help us then to, to see the, the, the beauty that comes and, the, and the, the power that comes from this kind of cooperation. Wonderful, thanks, Tom. Danielle, anything you'd like to add to that? Just, I think conversations like this, when I hear someone like Mike Weber talking about, you know, reflecting on thoughtful transition and being mindful of how our solutions could be tomorrow's problems, but thinking like these collaborations and looking back at, okay, now how do we, how do we move forward in a thoughtful way that's actually building a more sustainable, it just, it, it feels like we're in a better place to move forward rather than some of the reactive work that's been done historically because you know it, it would have been nice if we'd been having these conversations 30 years ago when I first got interested in this topic but we're having them now um which is good wonderful thank you well I would like to thank um all of you the four of you panelists um not only for sharing your great insight and and expertise with us today um but more importantly i want to thank each of you for the the greatly impactful work that you are doing um in your respect respective areas um we are all the better for it um so thank you i'm going to turn it back to ginger who's going to close us out for the day all right so thank you Panelists, and thank you, Carol, for moderating this for us today. Um, and thank you for all our attendees today. We hope you'll join us again for tomorrow's session. Uh, we'll start back at 1 p.m. Hope you have a good evening.